So I am happy to announce that Mr. Callum Baker is now going to be presenting his masterworks. You know, ever since I was a little boy, I've always loved video games. And because of that, I had many ideas for possible video games. And when Master rolled around, I figured this would be the perfect topic. I originally planned for my game to be a bird's eye view bow racing game. Sadly, I was not able to finish making my video game, because as it turns out, it is really, really hard. <laughs> but I still would like to share the process with you. Right. Hello, my name is Callum, and welcome to my Masterworks. Video games, the coding behind your favorite pastimes. In this presentation, I'll be telling you the process behind making a video game. But we can't talk about what goes into a game or the future games without looking at their past. While video games now we play are made by teams of hundreds, the earliest games are often made by just one person, and the quality suffered as a result. Take, for instance, the Atari 2600. The 2600 was considered revolutionary when it was released in 1977 and really kickstarted the home console market but it definitely didn't keep that status. Many of its games developed by a single person team were also made very quickly, often in three months or less. As a result, games start from game debilitating bugs and poor graphics. The Atari was not a very powerful machine. Computers nowadays have close to 30,000 times the power and over 250,000 times the memory. Because of these hard drive limitations, you couldn't use high powered coding languages like games use nowadays. But despite its flaws, the Atari was still seemed mind-blowing enough and was still wildly su successful, selling 30 million units. But it was eight years later, in 1985, when a new player on the home console market completely revamped the scene. That was when Nintendo released the Nintendo Entertainment System, the NES, and, the Super and flipped a switch on everything the Atari 2600 got wrong. Between the NES and the Super NES, released five years later, Nintendo introduced trends of having multiple programmers to make a game, so each person could put their personal strengths together to make a really good game. It also brought an end to the trend of pushing unfinished and unfinished bad games to the market. Instead, they spent more time to make a really well-made game. These systems still had low memory and ran very slowly. So while the types of games hadn't drastically changed, how they were made and their quality had. In the mid-1990s, the Sony PlayStation and the Nintendo 64 were released. These consoles finally allowed for high-level programming languages like C to be used to make games. Development teams stayed roughly the same size for the most part, but the software got better with more storage and the systems running faster. The expanded capability of these systems meant some games now came in 3D. Microsoft would develop their own console, the Xbox, to rival Sony and Nintendo. These three companies have continued to dominate the console market, rolling out a next generation console every six years or so. While the quality has largely universally increased, this is because these big three consoles have continued, have continued to build on past friends rather than revolutionize the gaming world. Meanwhile, games in the current generation of consoles, Xbox One, the PlayStation 4, or Nintendo Switch, take dozens, if not hundreds, of people to develop. But as all of us who play video games know, video games now are getting bigger and better than ever. I did not have a team of 100 to develop my own game. Like the 2600 developers, I was a single person team and in charge of every aspect. The problem was, I didn't know much about coding or programming. I know how games should look now, but for me, in designing my own game, it was back to square one. So where does one begin with designing and creating a video game? The very first thing you should do when creating a video game is what is called a game design document. Game design documents help you visualize what your game will look like and also the steps you should take to get, your fin to, get to your finished product. Game design documents are mainly used to keep track of all your ideas and to make a space where everyone can collaborate to reach the end goal of a finished game. Game design documents exist to promote clarity so everyone can understand what is going on and also to create a plan on how to finish it. The document should include websites you may use to make your game, description of your game, how the game functions, and what is going to be in your game. 
You can make a list and divide it between what you need and what you want to add in if you have time, as well as anything you, you, you find and might want to use later. You also should put in some art you'd want to put in the game. A game design document shouldn't be too long because at this point, you don't want to get into too much detail. It's all about the big picture. When I originally had planned to make my own game, then my game design document started with some possible websites to use to make my game. Then there's a small description of my game that includes game mechanics. After there's a list of all the things I want to include in my game, and everything that I highlighted in yellow are the things that I need to include in my game. I then list off all the possible sprites I would need and some possible art I could use. Also scattered throughout my document is advice and tips that I received from advisors and other people that I didn't want to forget. Once you have your game design document filled, you can, you can begin to flesh out the actual game design. Game design is laying out what the game you're going to make is actually going to be and everything that will go in it, game, like objectives, gameplay, and visuals. Aside from the physical construction of the game, this is probably the most important part in a game's development. Game design is usually done in the game design document within its own separate section. It is smart to include pictures for visual representation. Basic game design begins with a start, an end goal, and how the player will get there. Deciding what the main objective is is the easy part. The complicated part is to make it an entertaining experience for the player to go through. Entertainment usually starts by proposing a story. This can be very basic, or it can be very detailed and complex. It is up to your imagination. The next way to get the player to have fun is by shaping the rules and gameplay choices. This can be tricky because, because these choices must coincide with how you want the game to be played. For instance, you generally can't have a first-person shooter in one part and then a 2D platformer in another part. There needs to be structure so it all fits together and works like a puzzle. Without the structure, you have a bunch of pieces that just don't fit together. Another thing you need to keep the player engaged is having a role for them that is crucial to filling the story. You don't want the player wondering, why am I doing this? A key factor to understand the role of the player is to give them some freedom to find their purpose themselves, but not too much freedom or they become lost. You don't want to hold their hand, but you don't want to give them no guidance whatsoever. This is the main reason why open world games are so hard to create, but when done so well are so well received, like the game Red Dead Redemption 2. If the player is guided too much, it'll feel too linear, and like the player doesn't have a choice. But if the player isn't guided at all, they'll be lost and not know what to do, and ultimately, the player will give up. Finding a balance is crucial. In your game, you need rules, logic, and consistency. This can be more basic, such as having sounds that suit the environment, or having actions that will have impacts that make sense. For example, when a boat crashes into a rock, it will sink. These rules and logic don't need to be realistic, as long as they are consistent. That does not mean rules and logic can't change, it just means the player should feel semi-ready for it. The best way to make sure the player is ready is to tell the player when the change in rules and logic will happen and what the change will be. As a player, you don't want to feel cheated. The worst way to make a game harder is by adding things in the player can't avoid on the first try. There's also a balance you need to find with difficulty and rewards. If you don't give the player the correct amount of progress for doing th certain actions, the player will, come, will become bored or confused, and ultimately disengage. The game must make sense and must move forward in a logical way, from lights and sounds to actions with consequences, or else you risk the same result. Now, one of the hardest things to do is to make the game appeal to a wide audience, and is nearly impossible to appeal to everyone. This is difficult to measure because some games appeal to smaller audiences simply because not as many people like that genre of game. For me, I personally don't like role-playing games, RPGs. That doesn't mean all RPGs are bad games, it just means they're not for me. Without oversimplifying things, a game should appeal to all the people that it is trying to appeal to, whether that be a big or small audience. That is to say, the best games have focused audiences, and as a result, a focused game. You should measure this on how, on how well you captivate the audience you were targeting. With a filled and finished game design document, the physical construction of the video game can begin. In my case, I had some artwork, start point, and my end goal. With all the ideas ready, I was ready to begin coding. Or so I thought. I've learned it is just as important to understand how coding even works as how to do it. So I want to briefly explain how a computer actually reads code. A computer can't read, nor can it write. It really can't do anything unless you tell it to do something. But you can't just yell at a computer to do something. 
you need a way to convert your text into text a computer can process and perform actions accordingly. It's like giving a computer a to-do list, except it's written in a completely different language than ours. So different that it actually uses, it doesn't use language, it doesn't use letters, just ones and zeros. This, as some of you, as some of you may know, is called binary. I'll explain how binary works in more detail later, but for now you just need to know binary is just a way of counting, except instead of base 10, which is the number system we use, it is base 2. Computers can only read binary to perform tasks, but why can they only read binary, and how do they do it? Well, it starts with regular coding, like what you do in C++ or any other programming language. When you run the code or play it, it is put through a compiler and put into, do, into a to-do list in ones and zeros for the computer to read. This list is used usually basic functions like input this, output that, skip through line, find this memory, and so on. The binary, the binary code is called machine code. The reason a computer needs to read binary is that the computer already has a bunch of circuitry to perform multiple actions. It just doesn't know how to perform each specific action. The ones and zeros tell what circuits need to be on or off to complete the correct task. While the computer reads ones and zeros, we humans can't. So we use what is called source code, which is pretty much English text displaying actions and numbers in ways humans can understand. The compiler, meanwhile, locates the individual pieces of set of code, like separating each word of the code. After the pieces are organized into what is called a parse tree, this is to figure out what each piece represents and how they go together. The computer then locates important details like variables and function names, things the computer must remember for it to work. Then the computer looks at the parse tree and figures out the machine code that you can represent these steps with. The computer finally outputs a result that us humans can understand again. The best way to imagine this is to think if you're trying to communicate with someone who speaks a foreign language. You're the person who speaks English, the computer is the person who speaks a foreign language, and the compiler acts as a language translator. You talk to the translator, which processes the English you are speaking and turns into words a foreign language speaking person can understand. This information can be relayed back and forth between you using the translator. The computer's language is again binary, but how does binary even work, and why binary? Well, it's time to break up the chalkboard, or the whiteboard. just like our number system, 0 to 9, except binary is only two, two digits, 0 to 1. Before you can understand binary, you need to understand how our number system works. Our number system is base 10, 0 to 9 again, meaning there's, there's 10 unique symbols. Once you get past 9, the number on the right goes back to 0, and you add a number on the left side. The number on the left side represents how many times you've counted 10 on the right side. As an example, let's use a number like 376. So as you see, 376. The three here represents that we have counted past nine three times on this dial, and now we're at seven. And the seven represents we've counted to nine, we've counted past nine seven times in this dial, and has left, it at, left us at six. And the six here, because it's a single digit by itself, is used as a rest. Now, the reason our number system is like this is so we don't have to memorize millions of unique different sim symbols. I, like, Imagine if we, <laughs> uh, I asked you to represent 3 million one on the whiteboard if you had to use, a t if, you had to, if you had to use completely unique symbols. It's impossible. You'd either, you'd either have to know 3 million one unique symbols or draw 3 million one dots. Binary works the exact same way as base 10, except with only two symbols. So you start out with zero, then one, then 10, then 11, then 100, then 101, then 110, then 111. Just like this style here, the number on the left represents how many times you've counted past one to the number on the right. So here, this one represents we've counted past one one time here, and this one represents we've counted past one one time here, and as leaves set one, which is the single digit, which is used as a rest. You can convert binary to base 10, or vice versa, using some simple math. To convert binary to base 10, Start with any number. Let's use 15. The process you use is dividing the number by half and ignoring the remainder, if there is one. When dividing, you put the answer on the left side. You keep on dividing until you reach 1. Once you're done, you put a 1 under all the odd numbers and a 0 under all the even numbers. So 
So we start with 15. Now divided by half, that'll give us 7.5, but we leave out the rest, which just gives us 7. And divided 7 by half gives us 3.5. Again, leave out the rest. Divide by half, which gives us 1. And leave out the rest. And now we put a 1 under all the odd numbers and a 0 under all the even numbers. So all these numbers are odd. So that gives us the binary number of 1,111. So 15 in binary is represented as 1,111. To convert binary to base 10, start with any binary number. Let's use a number above again, 1,111. The process you use is starting from the left, you multiply each digit by 2 to the power of 0. As you go to the right, you add 1 to the exponent. Then you add it all up, and it gives you the answer. So again, we use 1,111. So we go 1 times 2 to the power of 0, which gives us a number of 1. Then we say plus 1 times 2 to the power of 1, which gives us a number of 2. Now, plus 1 times 2 to the power of 2, which gives us a number of 4, plus 1 times 2 to the power of 3, which gives us a number of 8. If you add all these numbers up, it'll give us again 15. So these two equations can be used with any number, and it will always give you the correct. So if you put in 18 here, it'll give you the correct binary number, and vice versa. The reason the computer uses binary is because instead of using 10 unique symbols, it only has to remember two symbols, which uses way less memory. When the computer reads binary, it can represent each one as an on switch and each zero as an off switch. A binary number like 10,110 can be represented with on, off, on, on, off. A switch in a computer is called a bit, and each set of eight bits combined is called a byte. One byte can store a value up to 255 using binary. Once computers start to get more complex, they also need more space to work with. So bytes got bigger. They went from 8-bit to 16-bit. <coughs> And nowadays, most bytes are as big as 64-bit. Binary can be represented, represented, can even represent letters and colors by giving each letter or color a binary number to go with it. Now that you know a bit about binary and how a computer reads code, it is time to put that information to use. The next thing to understand about coding are variables and functions. A variable is a way to store data and to represent objects and other things as a value. Variables allow you to keep track of specific data so you can consistently use it, use it. A good example is when you have a character in your game. You need to keep track of where that character is on the game's physical plane. You can make a variable to show where the character is and also you can change that variable to move your character around. It is pretty much like making a folder that shows complex coordinates and then referring your character to that folder. This allows your game to keep track of your character and for you to move your character. There are many different types of variable storage methods you can use. Each one of these variables are defined by how much you can store. One of the most basic variables is what's called an int variable, which is standing for integer. What you can do with this is store integers running from negative 2 billion to positive 2 billion. The way you do this is by writing int, and then what you want to name the variable equals the number you want to represent. So say we want to give a variable to represent my age. So we'd start off by writing int, and then we'd give the variable a name. So the name would be age, then we write equals, and then we give the variable a value to represent, which would be 14. And that's one of the most basic variables to do. Some other common variable storage types are char, short, int, long, and long, long. All these are written the same way as the example above. Char is used to store letter values. Float and double is used to represent numbers with decimals, and bool is used to display true or false. So say we want to make a bool about flipping a coin. We can write, just as the example above, we write bool, then we give it a name, so let's call it coin, and then we give it a value to represent. But in this case, we would write true. And so when you run this to the computer, it'll give you an output of one representing true. If you were to replace this with false, it'll give you an output of zero, which also represents false. While, vari while variables represent stored data, functions are sections of code written to manipulate data. Functions are written in their own section so you can easily reuse that code to perform the same action. 
Most people use functions, so there's less code to write out, and also so your script is more organized and easier to navigate. Functions can be easily called upon to be used, and the computer will read that folder the function is stored in. To make a function, you start by writing the type of variable. For instance, let's use int, and then giving the function a number or a name or action. You then write what you want the function to do. So let's say we want the function to multiply two numbers. It would look something like this. First off, we'd write int, and then we give the function a name. So let's use multiply. And now we need to give the function an action. So we'd write, or sorry, we're giving the function two variables to work with. We'd write int a and then int b. And now we will end off this line of code and we So this line here is telling us when we give the computer two values to represent these integers, it will return us the equation and give us an answer. So to call upon this function later, you can type int result equals, and then you'd write the name of the function, and then replace the variables in the code. So in this case, we replace a and b. Now we'd write equals multiply, which is the name of the function. And then we'd give the computer two numbers to represent the integers. So let's say four and five. Now when you run this to the computer, it'll give you an output of 20, which is four times five. The best way to use functions is when you have an action you need to repeat multiple times. When you call back the function, you can, use, you can simply change some variables, such as the numbers you're multiplying, and then you can run the code. It is good to know when you should use a function or to just keep things as regular code. I find once you use a, an action more than one time in different scenarios, you should make a, func a function for it. This is an, incre an incredibly quick overview of coding, and there's so much more I haven't touched on, like debugging, but all this coding knowledge is for naught if there's no game engine to build your game in. <laughs> Pretty much what a game engine does is create a base to easily make all the key features that go into game. But, there are three, but the three most important features are graphics, audio, and logic. Say you have a 2D side-scrolling game, or top-scrolling as my game was intended to be. You can't have the whole level loaded in at once, there just isn't enough uh, visual space. As you progress through the level, new objects are loaded in and the objects behind you are loaded out. But how do you keep track of all those objects and how can you easily tell, what, where, tell the game to load them in? This is where the game engine comes into play. The game engine can store all these objects in a memory together and label them accordingly. So when it is time to call upon a certain object to use, the game engine can search through its memory and provide it for the game to load in. This is just one example of what a game engine can do. The best part about game engines is that they can be used multiple times by different games. Nintendo uses Unreal Engine 4 to make all their games, but many other games from other developers also run on Unreal Engine 4, like Fortnite, Resident Evil, and Bioshock. <laughs> game engines allow us to work off pre-made structure and to build our game how we want. Having a game engine is like building a tower, except the base of the tower is already done for you. So all you have to do is design the tower how you want. The game engine provides a base that all games need in order to work, in order to work off. Of that, you make anything you want. It will be terrible and tiresome to have to repeat the same exact long steps every time you make a game. So the game engine does that for you. The foundation may always look the same for some skyscrapers, but the design of the rest of the tower is where true creativity shines. With the foundation in place, we can build the tower how we see fit. And that comes full circle back to the game design doctrine. With a fluent un understanding of coding languages, we can apply our start point, end goal, and journey in the middle. It's of course not that simple. There are countless hours of testing and polishing that go into making a game before it's release. But we built a strong foundation, and we have all the tools we need. There's no right place to end this off. Games today are constantly being worked on, fixed, and improved well after their initial release. 
There is no end to video games development. I hope, however, I have now outlined the tools and skills needed to make a video game, or at least the foundational ones. But these tools are only one part of the equation. It is now up to you to, it is now up to your own creativity to put it all together into your own creation. Personally, this project and essay was also a new experience for me too. I originally didn't understand the difficulty of programming and making video games. As I progressed through this project, I realized how hard programming really is and how long it can take. Even though I didn't make my own proper game, as I progressed through this project, I learned a lot about programming. I learned a lot of key concepts and tools that later I could easily apply to proper programming. Also, like learning a language in real life, learning C++ now makes it easier for me to learn other programming languages in the future. In general, this project has really opened my eyes to what it's like to be a programmer and what it's like to work in that field. This project also can help me in the future choose what career path I'll take. I'm happy with what I've accomplished in my project. The only thing I wish I could have done is to complete my own game to show off my programming skills. But that will come in time. The end of this project is not the end of my journey into programming. Before I go, I'd like to extend a large thank you to my internal advisor, Adam Ovenel Carter, for guiding me through this journey. Thank you to my two external advisors, John White and Carmine Carpino, for providing me with their help, with their expertise. Thank you to Jennifer Henriksen for, for always helping me out of sticky situations. And thank you to my parents for raising me and helping me out at home. And thank you to all of you for listening to me speak. I am very pleased to announce that Mr. Callum Baker has met all the requirements of the IPS Master.